Yeah? Yeah? It... That's not how it was in the movie. Why can't they just follow the book? Today, I'm going to be breaking down the differences between the novel and the screenplay for the Gum Javar scene in Denis Villeneuve's Dune. I am Carl T. Rogers, a story loss for a writer and director teaching you how to leverage visual storytelling for your screenwriting career. Whether you've read the book or not, there's still so much that we can learn about storytelling by looking at how, first, the original novel handles the scene, and then how that scene is translated into the screenplay. If you don't know, the Gom Jabbar scene is the really famous scene where um, the Reverend Mother is trying to test Paul by having him to do this specific task, and if he fails the task, then he'll be killed by this needle at his neck. And there's actually a really cool video that the director Denis Villeneuve did where he breaks down that scene and kind of walks you through how he approached that scene as a director. So if you've not seen Dune yet and you want to know the scene that we're going to be breaking down and discussing that's in the, the book and the screenplay, then maybe go watch that video uh, so that you can check that out first. Let's talk about how a novel and a screenplay approach storytelling differently. So first, in a novel, we learn what's happening by reading what's objectively stated on the page. Whereas in a screenplay, we have to kind of deduce what's happening using a lot of subjective visual descriptions and reactions, and subtext, and things like that. And that's because novels are internal. Everything takes place inside the character's minds. And so we get the mental and emotional perspectives of people like Paul and Jessica and the Reverend Mother and all the other characters interchangeably throughout the Gom Jabbar scene. However, in the script for Dune in the Gom Jabbar scene, we're mostly with Paul. And even when we're cross-cutting to Jessica, who is outside the room, it's still based on her imagining what Paul is going through. And so we're still empathizing with Paul by watching Jessica empathize with Paul. So now, for this breakdown, I'm going to be starting the scene when Jessica wakes up Paul. And this sequence is a lot longer in the book, which goes from page, at least in my version, goes from page 6 to 16. Whereas in the script, it's only pages 21 through 29. That is to be expected. Why? Because, like I was talking about, novels and screenplays are different storytelling mediums, which have different purposes. It's not that one is inherently better or worse than the other, it's just that there are different types of storytelling vehicles for expressing ideas and emotions. One, like the book, is going to be more internal, and one is going to be more external in the screenplay. So keep that in mind if you ever decide to adapt a novel into a film, or, like I did, adapt a poem into a film, which you can learn more about by watching this video up here. The main purpose of the Gum Jabbar scene in the book is to give the reader the knowledge of the world and the backstory that, so that you can follow what's going on. This is uh, an important scene in both iterations of the story. In both versions, we kind of learn things as Paul does. Although in the novel, there's still some kind of in the mind exposition to go along with that. We're learning things as Paul is thinking about them rather than as we watch them unfold. The script still does some world building too, but it's less about information and it's more about emotional impact. The purpose of the scene in the screenplay is to enable us, the audience, to experience the Gum Jabbar crucible, as it were, alongside Paul and Jessica and build up our anticipation of the danger that awaits the Atreides family on Arrakis. And so this is the first time in the story that Paul faces death, but it won't be the last. So that's one of the one of the bigger differences in the book. It's a lot more about exposition and kind of learning about the world, whereas in the script it's about showing this, um, how dangerous this world is, and giving us some kind of a, a foretaste of what that's going to be like. Another major change, I would say even more of a change than those scene purposes that I was just talking about, is the change in tone. Because the relationship between Paul and the Reverend Mother is much more antagonistic in the screenplay, much more enemies rather than just strangers. And so as we go through the screenplay line by line, I want you to keep this tonal difference in mind because tone is such an important thing in screenwriting. Now we've also got some structural changes between the book and the screenplay. These are less important because by nature, when you adapt from one form of storytelling to another, there's got to be structural changes. And that's because movies are visual and novels ain't visual. <laughs> you have to be a lot more pithy and subtextual in screenplay 
As we look through the screenplay, you'll be able to see how much material has been streamlined into the screenplay. For example, in the script, they kind of combine two scenes with the Reverend Mother into one. The screenplay does add Dr. Yue to the start of the scene as a way to help set the tone and also introduce his character because he's a pivotal character for the plot, but he doesn't have a lot of scenes otherwise, um, even, even in the novel. Uh, he doesn't come up very much at the beginning. So they had to kind of find a place to put him that would make sense within the story. Another structural change that they made from the novel into the screenplay is that before Jessica wakes up her son Paul, we actually see her watch the Reverend Mother arrive. We see like the ship come down and Jessica watching, and this helps build the tension of what's about to happen. And that is one of the coolest things about screenwriting and about cinema, is because you can have just these visuals that convey so much so quickly in such a small amount of space. <laughs> you know, you get this like ominous feeling of foreboding and dread and you watch this character react to what's happening and it makes you ask the question in your mind, oh well, oh well, no, what's happening? What's going to happen after this? Why is this character scared? All this kind of stuff. Whereas in the novel, Reverend Mother just kind of shows up and stuff starts to happen and it's explained as we go along. Uh, there's less back and forth between Jessica and the Reverend Mother um, before Paul is tested in the screenplay, whereas there's like, you know, some, some, some discussion in the book before the Reverend Mother dis dismisses Jessica. Whereas in here, it's just kind of like, she's like, leave. And that's all that really happens. There is some of that character development and that discussion between Paul and the Reverend Mother in the screenplay, but it's just after Paul has been tested. So it's kind of like explaining afterward what's happened and setting up more about what's gonna happen rather than it all being at the front, so to speak. These changes differ from the novel to the screenplay because filmmaking is about raising questions that you're going to answer later on, rather than answering questions as you go, which happens in a lot of novels. The novel is overtly teaching the reader, whereas the script wants us to kind of learn by observing. And this kind of goes back to the advice that you hear all the time about show versus tell. You can tell in a novel, whereas in a screenplay, you want to do a lot more showing. Okay, so let's dive into it page by page, beat by beat, to compare and contrast what's going on with this scene. I'm not gonna go through every single line uh, because then we'd be here all day, but I'm gonna show you some noteworthy moments. In the middle, I've got the actual chapter that shows Gum Jabbar. And then on the left and the right, I've got pages from the screenplay. And I've already kind of gone ahead and found some details that I specifically wanna point out to y'all. So here's page 21 of the script, and this is the area that I mentioned earlier where we actually see Jessica as she watches the Reverend Mother's ship arrive to build that tension, which is something that's not in the book at all. And it's done completely without any dialogue as well, which I think makes it an even more powerful scene. Another difference here between the book is we have kind of uh, a, a little bit of uh, of Paul dreaming, but, but mostly kind of just his inner monologue, almost. And some, some mentions of him dreaming, right? Whereas instead, in the script, we actually show what he's dreaming. And this is, once again, kind of a recurring theme where the novel is telling us something and the book is actually showing us something. Now, when we move on to the next page, I want you to notice uh, that throughout the screenplay, there are sometimes uh, word-for-word adaptations from the book into the script, and sometimes there's the use of similar words or some of the same words so that it still carries kind of the same feeling, but has been kind of changed a bit. And here's, here's, here's one where it talks about the Atreides crest. It says the Red Hawk crest. And then if we look, this also has that, except it is the green Atreides hawk emblazoned on his jacket. So it's like the same, but yet slightly different. And that is just uh, uh, interesting to me. I'm not sure why they changed it from red to green, but it's probably something they decided to do during the, during the rewriting process. Now look at this, just how well this is visualized here on the screenwriting side. Jessica stands over Paul in the dark room. The moon through the rain streaked glass paints them in rivulets of light. It's just two sentences, but it's such a vivid picture. You should 
strive to be just as vivid in your descriptions and yet just as pithy for your own screenplays. Another thing that I want to point out to you is uh, when Jessica wakes up Paul, in the book, she says, hurry and dress, the Reverend Mother is waiting. I dreamed of her, who is she? She's my teacher. What's Gum Jabbar? All this stuff. Whereas in the script, she just, she just wakes him up, Paul. What's wrong? And then she doesn't answer him. She just tells him to get up and come with her. And so we can tell from the way that she's acting and the fact that she avoids his questions that there's something she's not telling him. And this is once again helping to build the tension. And we are left in the dark as the audience, just like Paul, is left in the dark. Now, later on, when they go to the next part of this, uh, in, the, in the corridor, she does explain who the Reverend Mother is. She would like to know about your dreams. How does she know about my dreams? Paul here is like, I didn't even know anything about that or that she even knew that. Whereas in the book, he's just like, I will. <laughs> You must tell her about her, tell her about your dreams. I will. <laughs> like, there's no conflict there. Whereas in the movie, there's much more of like a, um, why are you telling my secrets, Mom? How does she know about my dreams? Why would I tell her? So it's it leads more to that adversarial relationship between him and the Reverend Mother, and also kind of the kind of uneasy relationship that he develops with his own mother throughout. Now let's keep going. Why is Dr. Yue here? This is what I mentioned, how they added him to this scene because he's not in the scene in the original book. Another change that they made in the script is how Paul doesn't know what's going on. What is happening, says Paul. Whereas if you remember up here, he already kind of knows. What's a gum jabar? <laughs> it's like he already, <laughs> he already knows that something's going to happen and what it's called. He just doesn't know what it is. Whereas this, he's completely in the dark. And so that makes it more intimidating. Right? And this happens over and over again. Why is the doctor here? What is happening? What are you saying? Paul keeps asking people and no one will give him a straight answer. Right? And so that repetition uh, kind of helps set up part of his character arc since as, as the story goes on, Paul will become more and more prescient in his ability to know things about people without them telling him. Also, I'm going to draw your attention to this really interesting line right here. Not dialogue line, but this line in the script. So Jessica reaches out to touch him one last time. Now technically this can mean, like, before the test she wants to touch him. But this can also refer to her feeling like, oh no, I might not ever see him again because he might die after this, <laughs> right? And so that is a really nice detail. And that's why I really like to encourage y'all to um, not just read screenplays, but then later to analyze them so you can get all these nuggets. So here we have, once again, Jessica saying, Paul, this test you're about to receive, it's important to me. Whereas in the script, like, we already know it's important because Jessica's like freaking out and won't tell him anything. Whereas here we have her stating, this test is important to me. Once again, I'm not trying to say that the screenplay is better than the book because of this. I'm just saying they are different storytelling mediums and that's one of the reasons why they're using these different storytelling techniques. Here we have the Reverend Mother um, kind of examining Paul and looking at kind of how he looks and we even get inside of her head which we definitely don't in the script because we're so focused on Paul most of the time and notice here when uh, he, Jessica is about to leave she says remember that you're a Duke's son whereas later in the screenplay she just says remember your training and so this change highlights that here it was more about reputation and identity, whereas this is like about survival. So they're similar, but they're still different, like that tone differences that I meant. And we still have the Reverend Mother kind of examining Paul and comparing him to his parents and grandparents, just like we do over here in the book, but it's so much shorter. Instead of, you know, these several paragraphs or several sentences, studied Paul, his oval face, his maternal grandfather, his uh, duke, paternal grandfather, you know, all of that is just summed up with this. Defiance in the eyes, like his father. You know, so it's an example of that being, being streamlined, right? Now, there are a couple of details here on this page of the script that are taken directly from the book, and I really like this respect that is given to the source material. 
Paul's line here, you didn't dismiss my mother in her own house? It's kind of been changed and shortened, but originally the line was, does one dismiss the Lady Jessica as though she were a serving wench? So this whole exchange, you know, is just kind of abbreviated to, how dare you? You know, that's like the subtext here. Another big change is how much attention is spent in the script to the voice and how the voice works. See, the command cracks like a whip. Whereas here in the book, it says, um, the command whipped out at him. So we have command and whip. And we have command like a whip. So even in the changing of the scene and rewriting it for a different storytelling medium, there's still a continuity of expression and thought here. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about being able to compare these two. So here we have some more similarities. Paul says, how dare you use the voice on me? Whereas earlier, and by earlier I mean just in the book, we have Paul thinking that, using the voice on me, he thought. But in the screenplay, he's outwardly defying the Reverend Mother instead of just thinking about it. She says, put your right hand in the box, fear shot through him, is this how you obey your mother? And we have a very similar exchange here in the screenplay. Put your right hand in the box, he doesn't comply, your mother bade you obey me. So once again, similar moments, similar beats, but compressed and uh, heightened, I would say, to make uh, these, these two characters more antagonistic towards one another. I also want you to be aware of how much this whole sequence of the Reverend Mother explaining what the Gum Jabbar is and you know what the needle does and that it's poison like all of this and how much back and forth they have paul like they, they have this really long conversation in the book right whereas in the movie it's just put your hand in the box stop he sees the needle and then she says you take your hand out you die you know <laughs> so it's kind of like skipping a lot of this to just get straight to the point which is put your hand in the box if you take it out you die which is you know one of the main focal points of the scene, especially in the movie. But we still have some of these exact lines from the book that are then uh, put into the film. What's in the box? Pain. And then you notice here, I mean, litany against fear that his mother had taught him out of the B'nai Gesserit, right? It's not fear. Fear is the mind killer. And so this is used. It's still included in the scene, but it's not Paul thinking about it. It's instead Jessica reciting it over here, right? And so it's this really cool way to justify cutting back and forth between Paul and Jessica while Jessica is imagining what Paul is going through because she's gone through it. And we also learn about her training and what the litany of fear is and everything. I must not, cure, I must not fear, fear is the mind killer, right? And so you've got these, these parts where we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, which also helps increase the tension of the gum jabbar that Paul is going through as well. Now before we go on to the next page of the script, I want you to take note of this. Curiosity reduced Paul's fear to a manageable level. Because this is kind of moved around to later in the scene, in the screenplay, on page 28. As he stares at her, his curiosity overrides his anger. Right? So it's a similar concept, similar words, but it's kind of rearranged to be put later in the scene where they thought that it fit better in the arc of the scene. We still have Paul asking the Reverend Mother, why are you doing this? But once again, even though Paul is asking a question, it's not explicitly answered like it always, or, or usually is in the book. Because in the book, she just says to determine if you're human, right? There's no sub subterfuge, there's no avoidance, there's just like, determine if you're, if you're human, be quiet, you know? Whhereas instead, she just says, an animal caught in the trap will gnaw off its own leg to escape. What will you do? You know, throwing it back at him. It's, a, it's another kind of reversal. Which is, of course, referencing this other thing that she does actually say in the book about animal chewing off its own leg. But once again, it has been condensed. We still have some more details that come through. Like we have this silence here, which um, will then be uh, later on, wait on here on page 27, as the pain gets further and further. So that gets moved around. We got some of these descriptions of what Paul is doing and what he looks like. Now, why did they include these in the script? Sweat stood on his forehead. Uh, he clenched uh, his left hand into a fist. Free hand by his palm. Things like that. Why are these included? These seem like very small 
details, like why choose to include these, but not some of these other things? It's because they're visual. You can see, the camera can see the sweat on his forehead, the camera can see, you know, his fist, and all of that helps communicate emotion. Whereas some of these other things would be a lot harder to communicate through the camera. Another great change that we have here is how we have the descriptions in the book of what Paul feels like is happening to his hand. It's got a tingling sensation, burning sensation, and then he felt he could feel skin curling black on the agonized hand, the flesh crisping and drop away until only charred bones remained. He thought he could feel, right? Whereas in the script, we just show that. We just show what he's thinking about. Paul's hand, crisp flesh falling from charred bones, right? So it's using the same, some of the same verbiage, but is uh, reimagined as an actual shot instead of just a feeling. And that's how they're externalizing that pain. And then some of this at the end of, near the end of the scene, where the Reverend Mother says enough, and then no woman child ever stood so much, I would, must have wanted you to fail, right? That is also taken straight from the book as well. Enough. No woman child has ever withstood so much. I was to wanted you to fail, right? And then she tells him to take his hand out of the box. So now that the test is over and Paul has survived, and we go on to the next part where he'll, he'll finally learn a little bit more about what was going on. We still have some of these same details where he expects to see a stump, but then he's amazed. We have this part, like I talked about earlier, his curiosity. Uh, and then we have another similar thing from the book where they talk about sifting sand through a screen to sift people. Once again, it doesn't have this, like, we find humans, right? Like the, the idea of Paul's humanity <laughs> being in doubt is never, is never even mentioned in the film. It's, it's more about who he is as a human. And so that subtext is kind of different. And I also want to mention, <laughs> like sifting sand through a screen some really great sibilance there. Sibilance is the use of the s sound in repetition, uh, which usually sounds pretty good um, coming from uh, sometimes a villain, sometimes a good guy, but normally it's from somebody who is bad and uh, it's try to sound kind of creepy. Sifting sand through a screen. Another thing that is a huge part of the scene in the book is all of the politics. There's so much about politics in here, all right? Like, why do you test humans? Are they Harkonnens? Did they send you? You know, the Bene Gesserit perform another function. Politics, um, politics indeed. There's the planet, you know, bloodlines, all of this stuff. Just like in the book that some of, the, you know, a lot of that happens after Paul has, has passed the test, but it is once again condensed into here. And one of the reasons why it's condensed is, like I mentioned earlier, because it's more about asking questions rather than answering them. Because I'm a Duke's son? No, because you're just his son. Right? You've proven you can learn yourself. You can rule yourself. And then they talk about a planet, and then she's just like, yeah, we'll see. Paul stares at her disconcerted. What does she mean? Once again, now Paul is wondering <laughs> more and more. Um, he's like, what did I just do? What just happened? Instead of him understanding more. Now he almost, in a way, understands less in the screenplay. One of the things that is, of course, the same is that once he passes the test, uh, the Reverend Mother calls his mother, Jessica, back in, you know, and she is relieved. We have some more of that. You know, your mother was tested. And then there's a little bit of discussion of, of the dreams. And this is what I mentioned about the other chapter in the book that has the Reverend Mother and Paul being combined with this one, because they talk about the dreams. And they also have this closing line in that other chapter, which is not right here, but is later on, uh, where the Reverend Mother says, Goodbye, young human. I hope you live. That's in a different chapter in the book. And so they've kind of combined those into this, because the important things are the Gamjabar and the dreams, and then her leaving. And then this other stuff, where Jessica and the, and the Reverend Mother talk to each other, uh, that's where you get some more of the politics and some more of the intrigue. Uh, but it's just the two of them. And that allows us to kind of get some of the answers that we weren't able to have earlier on in the scene. So this kind of stuff about truth saying and um, Bene Gesserit and uh, 
um, Muad'Dib and the Kwisatz Hederach and stuff like that. We do get some more of that in the film, but it's in this different scene without Paul, so that Paul doesn't know about it, right? As you can see, there's a lot of stuff that's similar from the book that made it into the screenplay, but there's also a lot of things that were changed, and those changes don't necessarily make it better or worse, they just make it different because it is a different vehicle for storytelling. Now you know the differences between the Gum Jabbar scene in Dune the novel and shooting script. Mash that like button if you learned something new and you enjoyed this and you want other screenwriters to learn about this as well. And if there's another scene or book adaptation into a TV show or movie that you want me to break down, let me know in the comments below. If you're worried about not being as creative or productive as people like Frank Herbert, um, then I encourage you to click the link below to get my free set of screenwriting hacks to crush writer's block so that you can feel more creative and get your screenplays done.